Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. Clarence Pearson of Marcus, Iowa, goes by Junior to anyone who knows him. He worked a family farm most of his life and gradually started collecting horse-drawn vehicles and farm implements. What started as a personal collection soon got too big for his storage buildings. He's got wagons, feed tillage equipment, planting and harvesting implements, carriages, buggies, and sleighs. He also has several pieces for processing the harvest after it's been taken off the field. Today we're going to spend most of our time looking at the wagons. Upcoming episodes will cover some of the other treasures in his museum. Well, I kind of started by accident. I had no intentions of making a museum. I collected a lot of stuff and had it in the buildings at home. It was too close together and nobody could look at it. And neither, not even I could go through it and look at it because it was all stacked together. And uh, I had a chance to buy this little acreage next to the fairgrounds. And um, I decided to move stuff in town. And of course, the buildings got full so fast. It's amazing how much you can collect on 20, 30 years of going, but it uh, just kind of accumulates. I just collected stuff. And uh, when I first started, I sold a few wagons to Texas for they made chuck wagons down there for barbecues. And the better the wagon, the more points they get, and big money down there. And, I decided there was too many good wagons leaving Iowa, so I started saving my own. And uh, when I started out, I happened to have five or six John Deere's that were different models, and I didn't realize it, but uh, that kind of got me started then. And um, a lot of these wagons are local wagons that, you know, come in this area. Some I had to buy farther away, but a lot of them are pretty general. And there's always, um uh, a question of whether you um, uh, strip a wagon down and repaint everything or whether you leave it like it was. Right. How, how do you decide what to do? Well, I look at it and if it looks like it shouldn't be done anything to it, I don't. I just clean them up and leave them original. Um, it's nicer to have the original stuff. Uh, there's not a painted wagon in here uh, that I know of. And all the wagons have names on their back axles, and a lot of them have names on the seats and the box. And uh, it's just uh, a different, every wagon's different for sizes and wheel sizes. And, and I rate a wagon like a pickup. Some are half ton, some are three quarter, and some are one ton. I always had horses ever since I was 12 years old. I had saddle horses, and then I went to uh, draft horses because I was getting too hard. I'm bad to ride horses, my knees are getting bad, so I went to driving and boy, it was a lot of fun. So uh, then I started a museum and I picked up machinery that was all horse drawn and that's my theme of my museum. Uh, there's only two gas engines in here and that is because the horse drawn implement come with that engine on it to run it. Otherwise, uh, it's all horse drawn. I am open by appointment only. Uh, I can't sit here every day waiting for somebody to show up, but uh, when they come, uh, I will give a guided tour. And if I do a guided tour anymore, I'm gonna have to charge a little bit more because you'll learn a lot more by having a guided tour than walking around. Uh, we've had tours from two to three hours long because people ask questions. And when they're on their own, they don't realize some of the history some of this stuff has. You don't have an admission price, but you recommend a $10 donation, free yes, goodwill uh, donation. We've got to have a little bit to keep the lights going because uh, this museum is by far not a money-making outfit. The farm show has been... Oh, right here. This here is a very old evener that they made in the old days. And I would imagine that thing's a couple hundred years old, just made out of a tree. But... Uh, Somebody had to make that when they didn't have any money. I have a chart that shows all the companies that uh, the majors have bought, the John Deere, the IH, and the Case, and uh, they bought a lot of their competition. 
And the reason they did that is they, they bought the full line, what that company had, and they had it already developed, so they just kept building. And it's the same today. They keep buying each other out, and uh, that's the way the big business works. Uh, Weber started in 1854, and then they sold out to uh, IH in about 1910, and uh, that's why you got the international name on them now, or McCormick Deering, I guess it is. But uh, they also bought out other companies. This Columbus next door here is, is another one that uh, IH bought. And if you notice, the end gates are exactly the same. It's just uh, yeah. another company. Right, right. Yeah, it's, um, it's nice to see all of the seats original to the wagon. Right. That's kind of that, rare. That, that's what I like to do is get the seat that matches the wagon. Some wagon companies didn't put their name on their seats. So it's hard to, you know, justify a seat for that. But uh, yeah. Yeah. we try to match them up. Um, I have probably, uh, there's 60 seats around here for somewhere. Uh, you'll see them in the uh, shells after a bit here. Sure. So this is a pretty good sized uh, grain wagon. Right. This is uh, probably the middle, middle size one. Um, I figured like the three quarter ton. Uh -huh. And as they get bigger, they get more heavy weight. Um, the, the wheels will get bigger. Well, depending on what kind of ground they're on. That's debatable. Uh, a narrow, tall wheel pulls easier on hard ground, but a wider wheel will float more, you might say. And uh, some areas, they want the high, tall wheels. Texas, that's what they want, tall wheels. To me, I buy any wagon that's got a good wheel. Yeah, regardless. I'm not fussy. Right. So. Yeah. Now, some of these wagons are Iowa wagons. This one's made, uh, Charter Oaks are made in Southern Iowa. Uh, Birkins down there is made in Iowa. Mm. This one here is made in Shell Rock. That's over in your country. Right, right. Yeah, near Waverly. That was a small company. It's a beautiful box, uh, well made. It's on a stout and gear which was made in Wisconsin. And it's got a wider wheel on it. This, got, this is a real heavy duty one here. Yeah. Uh, this is probably the one ton. The John Deere here is real heavy too. It's got the extra heavy reach in it. And the reach is um, the, the... It'd be the piece that joins, those, joins, joins the back axle and the front axle. Yeah. I mean, you see how thick that is. And, right. These are all basically, basically for the same kinds of jobs, but they all have their unique differences, don't right. they? they? The one thing about these wagons that's unique, they're all 38 inches wide, unless you get a 42, and they're all 10 foot six. So the seats all interchange with everybody. The boxes interchange with everybody's gears. They had their acts together then. Um, it's just unique how they did that. So I can put a John Deere box on an IH gear or Weber gear and it fits perfect, you know. But right, right. Some areas of the country, they, had, they went to 42 inches, that's southern area mostly, and uh, I did see one John Deere that's 12 foot long, which is a, kind of a rare one. I wonder if those southern wagons were for cotton or more for lighter, lighter loads maybe? These wagons were used for everything on a farm. I mean everything. They took Sometimes they went to town with the family and church and stuff. But they were used for hauling grain, hogs. Uh, they can put racks on them to haul uh, a bull or something, but you want a pretty good rack on there. But they were very versatile, and that was the main thing when the uh, settlers went across the country, they had a good wagon. And that was their backbone. It was like their car for today. Sometimes you see a car with a lawnmower sticking out the rear end. That was the same as a wagon. You might see a bull sticking out the rear end. Right, right. 
If you enjoy seeing how our ancestors lived during America's rule yesterday, you're going to love looking at these books. Volume 1 is fieldwork showing horses and vintage tractors preparing seed beds, planting, cultivating, and harvesting the crop. Volume 2 shows the work being done in the barn and farmyard, feeding and watering the livestock, getting the crop into the barn, milking the cows, shearing the sheep, and collecting the eggs. In Volume 3, we go inside the home to see the family in the kitchen canning vegetables, in the parlor listening to the radio, and in the dining room for family supper. We also head into town to shop at the general store or visit on the town square on Saturday night. Each book has over 140 large format pages. They sell for $24.95 each, or you can buy two for $44.95, or all three for $54.95 plus shipping. Call 1-877-647-2452 to order. That's 1-877-647-2452. We look at one bottom plows and uh, one uh, row corn planters, and now you go drive down the road and you see corn planters. Uh, a 12 row is getting to be obsolete anymore, and they're getting up so large, and it's an entirely different ball game than the old days. Even the old days when you were grain farming, probably. Um, right. Because now it's hard to get them down the road. Oh yeah, yeah. When I uh, we started out, uh, we had a two bo uh, two row planter, a modern one on an H farm all, and then Dad went to a four row, John Deere 490, and then after that we got into uh, an eight row uh, H, and then we went for a 1230 John Deere, and that's when I quit because things are getting too out of hand for me. This all high tech stuff, I don't understand it and I let the young guys do that. This back here is a little John Deere one horse wagon uh, that was picked up out in uh, Indiana. And uh, when I bought it, I went to the auction and, uh, at Montgomery and I had no intention to buy anything and I saw this wagon and uh, boy, you don't see these every day, so we bought it. My problem was we had a car and I thought, how am I gonna get it home? So at the auction, they had a little utility trailer there, and uh, I bought the trailer, took the wagon apart, <laughs> hauled it over to an Amish guy, and we went on to Kentucky to see our granddaughter, and then we come back, I picked it up and went home with it. <laughs> so you gotta buy stuff when you find it and figure out how to haul it later. <laughs> but if you notice, that there's about six John Deere wagons in here that are all different models. Right, right. They're wooden axles, or wooden uh, gears with steel wheels, tall, narrow wheels, and uh, wide wheels, steel wheels, a flare box. You don't have any duplicates, basically. You got, you got a wide variety of stuff here. Right. Like I say, I like to collect anything that's good and showable. And if you look up above, there's my rows of seats. That John Deere Weber seat's kind of a rare one there. If you notice that Weber's got two B's in it. Oh yeah. He was a manager of the Minneapolis plant and he was related to John Deere and he got to put his name on the items up there. I've got a few items here in the museum that has the Deere Weber on them. Huh. So it's got nothing to do with Weber wagon. No, this is not yeah. the Weber wagon. The Weber wagon was, had only one B. Right. The Weber with the John Deere is two B's. Okay. This wagon here is not a, the original paint job, it was the way I bought it, but it's such a good wagon and the guy did a pretty good job of pinstripping it and everything and uh, so I put a, a bull rack on it, I guess you call it. And that's how they hauled livestock. To market or hauling bulls for breeding? Well, or moving for from whatever. farm to farm or whatever. Yeah. But you wouldn't want a very rank bull in there. Right. He'd probably tear it up pretty good. Right. And this here's a Davenport gear, and that's they bought were bought out by John Deere, and uh, it's a, got bearing in it and everything. And here's another interesting thing. If you look up there, there's three Herschel seats in a row. Right. And the pinstriping's a little different on them. Right. But my theory is that when they had the factories going, they might have three or four guys pinstripping and they all had their own certain way of doing it. Right. 
and people will argue that it's not original, but that's what my theory is. Sure, right. It wasn't a, a machine doing it the same. Every no, this pinch ripping was, was all done by hand. Right. The bobsled with a, a steel that, seat. Well, the steel seat is Davenport. Okay. And I don't know what the original colors were, so I just left it alone. Sure. I've never seen one with the original paint on it, so I don't know. But uh, it was one of the seats, only seat that I know was made by uh, uh, a wagon company that's steel. A Stilton Wagon Company. They use these in the wintertime to haul their hogs to town. Uh, and they tipped over very easy because the tracks are not like the horse tracks, they're too narrow, and then when you get snow, my dad said uh, they tipped over wagons before with hogs in it, and he says that's kind of fun to pick them up. <laughs> On a cold day. <laughs> and another thing, that end gate ain't too handy to take out when you got hogs in there. <laughs> right. I wonder if the Stoughton Wagon Company turned into the Stoughton Trailer Company. I think they did. Yeah, that's I think so. That's a big company. That's a little dray wagon here that I picked up, and I got a, a left-handed John Deere plow mount on it, and that's how they used to haul things around in the old days. Sure. <coughs> and the left-hand plow, um, those were kind of regional, weren't they? I've asked a lot of people about that, and I can't come up with a definite answer. Uh, I just can't tell you why there's left-handed and right-handed plows. Yeah. Uh, it's, maybe it's regional. Yeah. I don't know. I think the country's getting too big for themselves. Everybody's, everything's got to be big, 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 bigger. And uh, I stop and think of all the corn that some of these guys got to haul every year. Uh, it just don't make sense to me. I always figured, what, well, you, one guy could farm on a farm was enough to work. But now they have to hire people, and uh, it's just, uh, I'm glad I quit farming. Let's talk about the covered wagon. Uh, that's just the way the Charlie Goodnight started this fad when there was cattle drives, and they hauled all their gear in there, and uh, their cook stove and everything. And the cook was uh, the doctor, the cook, and nobody gave him any flack because they did. They didn't get nothing to eat, but they, uh, he was pretty well their number one man out on the trail. That's got a big wheel. Yeah, that's a tall now. Now down here, that's a brake <coughs> that they use to go down steep hills <coughs> yep. to drag the wheel. Uh, originally, they used to throw a tree in there. Right. It's a lot but it was wheels. hard on spokes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. But boy, they went down some pretty nasty hills. Yeah. Is this a long box? Here? No, no, it's all the same. same. Okay. Yep. This wagon's, uh, well, it's not older than that now because if you look on the back axle there, it's got, uh, it was made in 1894. You have to change that, that number all the time, don't well, you? Well, I'm behind right now. Right, right. <laughs> Interesting, because this is what they cost new. You want to zero in on that? Yeah. They only cost 60 to $70 for a wagon. Right. The seat was only uh, $3.25 with a lazy back on, which is the piece up above was a 50 cents more. And the wagon would come on a, disassembled on a, in a, on a train, probably. Yeah. And the dealer would get it, and then you'd they, Montgomery they would put it wagon, together. Montgomery Ward wagon over there was made by another company up in um, Wisconsin, I believe. And they were all sent by freight, you know. You buy them on the catalog. Yeah, right. This spreader is a 1905 model. That I never did anything to that. Wow. It's just the way I bought it. Hmm. Wow. It's IH. Uh, started out as clover leaf and uh, international bottom. 
it's amazing how well preserved it is. They get some pretty rough service. Well, yeah, and I don't know if some of the, the new manure they hauled it in, I don't think this would handle it too good. Right. A lot of straw in it, but it, this one's got an original repair style in it. Yeah. Yeah, I was at an auction in Missouri and the auctioneer was Mennonite and uh, he noticed I was buying some stuff and he asked me afterwards, he says, you looking for anything else? And I said, well, I don't know, what do you got? And he said, well, I got a wooden manure spreader. And I thought, well, they're usually rotted to death, you know. And I says, okay, uh, where is it at? And he says, about two miles from here. Well, I said, I got a trailer load now, but I'll come and look at it. And it was in a big pole shed kind of by itself on the cement floor. And I walked through the walk-through door and I saw it over in the corner. I says, I'm going to own that spreader because I can see how good it is. Yeah. <laughs> and he was very reasonable with it. People kind of like to know that you're going to be displaying it and that's a big tricker right there uh, if it's going to a museum they kind of favor that but you because know, yeah. that's why they have it to preserve it well they had it in the family yeah and it's time to move it because it's in the way and uh, people will sell it to a museum easier than to a junk man you know right now this wagon is that's it's a mitchell. hoisted. It's got a it's 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 got a hydraulic uh, jack under it. It's an eight inch bottle jack. Okay. And I, we was farming. We had one of them on our uh, flare boxes for unloading corn. That was better than an overhead one. Mm. And it lifts up quite fast. It's just an eight inch bottle jack. It you crank it. It. Uh, you just pump it like a bottle jack. Okay. And it's got a scissors action. It's real fast. Right. 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 Yeah, but it was real nice for unloading corn. Yeah. Better than the overheads. This uh, oil wagon was a basket case when I got it. Here's what it looked like to start with. And, yeah. and uh, it's, everything's new in it. That took a lot of Tanks work. don't leak either. They'll hold fluid. Did you do much of this work yourself? I did it all did except work? the painting of the lettering. Yeah. And there's a farmer north of town here did it for me. Wow. And he used to teach uh, art in high school and he retired and went to farming. But he did a beautiful job on that. Yeah, he sure did. It's gorgeous. It's and you did a great job on the restoration. Them all new wheels, it took them over to the Amish. There are extra spokes in them. I think there's 16 in there instead of 14. Yeah, you can tell it's heavy weight. And uh, it's hard to find them like that, that uh, the tank don't leak. Thanks for joining us today at Rural Heritage and RFD TV, where we borrow from yesterday to do the work of today. This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging, as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information. Or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.